Hello, Dog Nation, and welcome back. I am Kaylee Mansell with Dog Nation insider Connor Riley. We told you guys we had a big announcement for y'all this week, and no, it's not just the fact that Connor's in person today. We've got a new show for you, new name, new everything at the end of the day. We've gone through what? Four, four names, mm -hmm. eight different backgrounds, but here we are, finally gonna give Dog Nation some consistency. So Dog Nation, this is the remix, let's roll it. It's the show for the new breed of Georgia Bulldog fan. This is Dog Nation at Large, with Dog Nation insiders, Connor Riley and Kaylee Mansell. Well, there you have it, guys. It is Dog Nation at large. And even though Brandon Adams did spoil it for us on your Tuesday appearance, that's okay. We're still excited. Dog Nation at large is really supposed to be about anything. We want to talk about what the fans are talking about. We don't want you guys to ever know what it is that we're going to talk about on this show. It's all about expecting the unexpected. Yeah, and so I think it's going to be a really fun show. We'll talk, obviously, Georgia football. But other things that come across our mind, you know, we've ranted about St. Patrick's Day before. <laughs> we've talked about Connor Cayley showdowns. I think this show is going to be a ton of fun, and I'm looking forward to and it. I don't know about you, but something about that intro music makes me want to put my head through this wall because it's so awesome and so different than anything else we hear on Dog Nation. Yeah, it's a unique show geared maybe towards a little bit of a different audience, but we look forward to bringing you guys engaging content and talking the best and brightest when it comes to Georgia football. And hopefully we're going to be able to start off with a strong show today. Here's what we've got in store for you. It's G-Day week. Lots to talk about. A lot of eyes are going to be on the quarterback, and not just Carson Beck, but Gunnar Stockton as well, and why this game's going to be so important for him. Then we're going to talk about the DB room, a group that people are excited to see, but after the game is over, might, they might not also be in that room. And then we're going to end with the players that you need to watch on G-Day, and then Connor and I are going to have a little fun on the show. Not a Connor Kaylee showdown, but we're still going to get after it. No, not quite yet, but I think, I think you guys are going to like how we're able to end the show this week. All right, so let's go ahead and begin it with the quarterbacks. Carson Beck waited his turn. We know what he's capable of. A lot of analysts are calling him the number one returning quarterback of the class, but then you've got Gunnar Stockton on the other hand, a guy who I think that kind of got lost in the limelight last year, especially when Carson and Brock Vandergriff were battling for that spot. But we saw what he was capable of in the Orange Bowl. So in your mind, who is G-Day more important for, Carson or Gunnar? I think by far it is Gunnar Stockton. I think this is a guy who, with limited reps last season, didn't really get to show a lot. We saw that in the game against Florida State, and the way that he played against Florida State is just very different than I think he's going to be allowed to come out and play on Saturday. He's going to be asked to win from the pocket, make difficult throws downfield. They're not going to let him get hit and run around. He's going to be in a non-contact jersey, and I think this is a chance for Gunner to show the steps that he has made, not just through his point in career at this point in time, but this spring in particular, because Georgia's got a pretty big decision it wants to make coming out of this spring, knowing it wants to get to four scholarship quarterbacks, and the easiest way they're going to be able to do that is through the transfer portal. So I think Gunnar has a chance to show that he's a capable backup, someone that can continue to grow and get better, but also be a factor in the Georgia quarterback job moving forward. Mm -hmm. And Gunnar actually got the talk, actually got the opportunity to talk to the media on Tuesday. Here's what Gunnar had to say about G-Day. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, leading up to it, I got a bunch of reps, um, and uh, just like this spring, I've gotten hey, a couple ones, reps, twos, and a bunch of threes, and uh, just because. Um, yeah, but I, I got a bunch of reps, and uh, I think it's, it's valuable, and um, I think I try to cherish it and uh, just make the most of it. Talking about those extended reps, just how big of an opportunity do you see Saturday as, and what is it that you want to show? Yeah, I want to show everybody that I can play. Um, that's what I tried to do in the Orange Bowl, I thought I did, and um, I think it's an opportunity to just go play a game. That's the way I look at it. Play with everybody. So when I watch this, I look at Gunner. look at that smiling face. You can tell that he's just excited to get out there and compete because I think even back to his time at Raven County, like you can tell he's a gunslinger. He wants to get out there and get those reps. And he's got a lot of the Stetson Bennett comp, but he's finally going to get the opportunity to show what or what he's capable of on Saturday. Yeah, I, again, I think this is a really big opportunity for Gunner to go out there and show what he can do, show how he has improved as a passer. This is a guy that is universally beloved by his teammates and what he's going to be able to go out there and do. He's going to work with the first-team offense a little bit. We saw him get to do that in the Orange Bowl. And, look, obviously there's going to be a lot of eyes and attention on Carson Beck. He's, by all accounts, had a fantastic spring. But with where the quarterback position is for Georgia right now, with Ryan Puglisi dealing with a little bit of a knee injury, he's going to be limited 
on Saturday. I think there's a lot of opportunity at stake for Gunnar Stockton. And based on what we've seen thus far, I think he's going to step up and deliver. So here's what I like about Gunnar. This is a guy that has, what, 55 snaps under his belt, but through his player availability and the interviews that he's given, he's also able to acknowledge that he has had an up and down spring, but every time he's had those downs, he's been able to acknowledge what he did wrong, and I think that's exactly where you want him to be headed into this Saturday. Right. You've heard Kirby Smart talk about Gunnar's ability to recognize, hey, like I made a mistake here, here's what I was looking at, and then Kirby sort of acknowledged, okay, he was looking at the right things. Hey, how do we adjust that moving forward? You know, spring is, I think, is a big time for guys like backup quarterbacks. I think you've seen Carson Beck. He would not be the player that he is today if he didn't make the strides he did when he was Georgia's backup quarterback during the 2022 season behind Stetson Bennett. I think Georgia very much wants Gunnar Stockton to take those similar steps that Carson took as Gunnar ultimately potentially one day becomes the starting quarterback for Georgia. And the good thing about Gunnar is that he's had time to learn under elite quarterbacks like Carson Beck and like Stetson Bennett, and I think that really showed in his Orange Bowl performance. So let's take a look at his statistics from the Orange Bowl. You have here, he went 6 for 10 with passing, 96 yards, 2 touchdowns, 0 interceptions, and 7 carries for 46 yards. But I remember watching the Orange Bowl and everybody's kind of eyes lit up when they saw that Gunner is a scrambler. And I think that's where the Stetson Bennett Stetson Bennett comparison came in as he's somebody who's able to move around in the pocket and isn't afraid to go. But the thing is, I think people forget that Gunner Stockton can throw the ball. I know that people see that as Carson's strength, and so they look to Carson to know that he's a guy that can throw the ball downfield, but they also forget that Gunnar Stockton holds the Georgia high school record for not just total yards, but passing yards and total touchdowns. So I'm excited for him to get out there Saturday and, and throw the ball because we know that with the no quarterback contact, we're not going to be able to see him run the ball like everybody knows him to do. Right. This is not, I think, an ideal situation for Gunnar Stockton's skill sets. He's a guy that wants to run around, make plays outside of the pocket still throw downfield but also has the ability to take off and run if need be I think that's where the Stetson Bennett comparisons come in and and so he's going to be asked to try and win in a way that quite frankly he's just not comfortable doing so And, and I think you know if we see him make some positive plays from the pocket you've heard him talk about the need to go out there and do that I think that's another positive sign from his development stylistically him and Carson Beck are very different and I think it's important to acknowledge that and that's why you know I think G-Day is set up for Carson Beck to succeed to put up good numbers because it is so tailored to the way that he already plays but with Gunner I think it's going to be a big learning step for him in showing people hey like I know you saw the way that I played against Florida State it was really the only chance people have had to see me play real reps I can win in a a variety of ways there too and I think the other thing to keep in mind with Gunner like Stetson Bennett, when the lights come on, that is when he plays at his breast. He's not a perfect practice player, but he is someone who is able to elevate his game in high-pressure situations. And make no mistake about it, this Saturday, I think, for Gunner is a pressure situation. I think one thing that I'm interested in watching is how well he meshes with the wide receivers because we've talked about him all season long. Dylan Bell, Dominic Levitt. We're not going to see Rao Thomas, but we are going to get to see the emergence of Colby Young. I'm curious to see that since we only got to see Gunner primarily in that one game, game how well is he going to mesh with the weapons and options that Kirby Smart has talked about this spring right and you're going to see him work with both I think the first team offense and the second team offense and you're going to see him work with all of those wide receivers Georgia wants to rotate it and have a deep cast you've even heard guys like Dominic Lovett talk about it earlier this spring uh, of getting familiarity and comfortable with all the quarterbacks on Georgia's roster here so I think with Gunner he's going to get a chance to work with a lot of the same weapons that Carson did there because of the fact that there's no Brock Bowers and there's no Lad McConkey. I, I think you're, you're sort of finding out who your top playmakers are for Georgia right now, and Gunner's going to get a chance to work with some of them, as is Carson, and I think that's going to, in the long run, make whoever those playmakers ultimately are better because of the fact that they're just working with multiple quarterbacks and know to adjust to certain skill sets. So here's what I like about Gunner. He's a guy that's not afraid to compete. He almost reminds me of Carson Beck in that sense that he knows that he has to wait his turn and when it's time he's going to compete for the job. But I do think when it comes down to that, he's not going to be scared because the transfer portal will open back up on April 15th. We're expecting UGA to try to go out and get a quarterback. But I I think that Gunner's excited to have that competition and have reps against someone because Ryan Puglisi has been out with that injury. So here's what Gunner Stockton had to say. Yeah, um, Coach Smart's always said he wants like he wants four quarterbacks and uh, scholarship quarterbacks on on the roster, and uh, I think that's what it probably should be um, at the University of Georgia. I mean, as a quarterback, why not? Why not? Would you want to come here? So uh, oh, I guess a 
it's about it should be a battle and competition and everything so just awesome again i don't know if he just has that great poker smile face but that does not seem like someone who's scared to go out there and compete especially knowing that in this day and age you don't have to be a three-year starter to be a top round pick in the nfl because we know that carson's going to go first round he's only going to be a two-year starter so i think that he understands the value of going out there and competing and i think having another quarterback come in could see him propelled to be the best version of himself as an athlete, and I think that's going to be showcased on Saturday. Yeah, it's important to remember Gunner in his recruitment came in in the class behind Brock Vandegrift. Brock Vandegrift was hyped as the five-star quarterback who was going to be a one-day starter for Georgia. And even with that in mind, Gunner still went out and committed to come play for this Georgia program. And so uh, he's not afraid of contact. He's not afraid of competition. I think that's something that matters to him. I think that's why Georgia in particular likes and values him so much. Uh, you, you see some of these quarterbacks out there, they're mercurial in their ways, you know, maybe looking to move on to a transfer portal if things don't break the right way after year one or certainly after year two. I think Gunner has always sort of understood he was going to have to wait his time and develop here at the University of Georgia. But... He believes in that process. He's seen it work with Stetson Bennett. It's working right now with Carson Beck. And I think Gunner legitimately believes that that can be the same case for him. And I know that Georgia believes in Gunner just as much. So when it's all said and done, is there a shot that Gunner Stockton can pull out the win Saturday at G-Day? I, I think, yeah, of course, there is. And it, so much of that's going to come down to how the first-team defense plays. Now, you know, again, scoring in these spring games is always a little bit difficult and weird. And we'll see what Georgia ultimately decides to do. Traditionally, it has been. First team defense, second team offense versus first team offense, second team defense there. I think with the spring that Carson has, and we can use this period to talk about him a little bit, I think he's going to come out really sharp, really poised, have a strong showing on Saturday. And with the fact that you do have some newness in the secondary, there's not going to be Malachi Starks out there. And I know we're going to touch on the secondary here in a little bit. I think Carson Beck is going to have a really big day, and I think that might be tough to overcome for Gunner and that second string offense. So while we only got to touch on Gunner briefly here, both Connor Riley and Mike Griffith have put out articles about Gunner Stockton and his tendency to battle and compete on our dognation.com website. That it's always free, so make sure to go and check that out. So now you mentioned the secondary. We've got to shift to it because in, in my eyes with Javon Bullard, Tyke Smith, Kamari Lasseter gone, you think there would be some concern around the UGA fan base with your three-star guys being gone. However, I feel like there's so much excitement around this position group because it's a good mix of veterans and rookies coming in. And even though Malachi Starks is not going to be at G-Day, I think the opportunity that these guys have had to learn from him in the spring season has been tremendous and, and it's going to be invaluable as the season progresses. So here's what Malachi Starks had to say about the secondary. Just going out there and compete, you know, everybody being on the same page, uh, just seeing guys wanted to know know what the job is and how to get it done, and just going out there and compete, because, yeah, you know, like we, I like to say we play the hardest position over the field, you know, we're going to get up the ball top to top, but it's, about, it's always about the next play, so, uh, I mean, it's going to happen, but I want to see guys, when it does happen, how do they respond, so um, I think that that would say a lot about the room that we have. As we mentioned, Malachi Starks has been injured this spring season. We're not going to get to see him play at G-Day, but I can't think of a better guy to lead, not just the veterans, but also rookies in the spring season. Um, I mean, Malachi was put in an interesting position, almost similar to K.J. Bolden. Right. You know, Malachi is a guy who's done a lot of things for Georgia already. He started 28 straight games for the Bulldogs, played in every game he's been at Georgia for. Obviously not practicing this spring as he recovers from a shoulder injury. But I think with Malachi, he understands what K.J. Bolden is going through. He knows what Dan Jackson is trying to do in terms of breaking into the starting lineup. He's been there with so many of these defensive backs in the secondary. They're competing to be starters because he himself has gone through it. And I think you've heard Malachi talk about this this spring. The ability to, to have relationships with everyone on this roster, be it coaches, and obviously players there as well. It's helped make him a better leader this spring. And, and so on Saturday, I'll be interested in seeing how involved he is. Well, I expect him to dress out. He's obviously not going to play. He is not yet cleared for contact. Uh, it'll be interesting in seeing how this secondary goes out and performs, knowing Malachi is ultimately going to be back, but they're going to have to pair somebody alongside him, given how much Javon Bullard, Tyke Smith, and Kamari Lasseter at the cornerback position meant to this Georgia program in recent years. I think that the class that I will be looking out for the most is the sophomores, especially Janelle Aguero and Daniel Harris, because I feel like in the past 
UJ's had really strong DB. So your freshman year, you're just kind of watching from the sidelines. You might get some reps on the special teams. Your second year is all about getting into that rotation. And then you might be starting by your junior year. But for those two, they saw reps in their freshman year. And I really think that we're going to see them flourish this year. So I'm definitely going to have my eyes on that sophomore DB group. Yeah, Janelle Aguero in particular is someone that's super interesting to me. A guy that I think is going to be Georgia's starting star when it's all said and done. Has had a good spring. I don't think he's quite locked down that star position yet. But you look at what Tyke Smith was able to do there last season. Even Javon Bullard, when he played that position two years ago, they asked that guy to be a playmaker in the secondary. Uh, Tyke Smith led the team in tackles, tackles for loss, and interceptions a season ago. Uh, Janelle obviously has a long way to go in terms of getting to the raw football experience that Tyke Smith had, both from his time at West Virginia and then obviously the three years he spent at Georgia. He's got a lot of athleticism, a lot of upside. He's someone who George ultimately probably thinks one day can play that safety position as well. But Saturday, I think, is a real opportunity for him to go out and show what he can do. Daniel Harris at the cornerback position as well. I mean, this guy is like built in a lab. He, he is a terminator at that cornerback position. He has the size that you want, the speed that you want to see out there. And I think he's a guy that now that he's had a year to develop, you saw him play significant reps in that Florida State win in the Orange Bowl. I, I think those two guys in particular, as you point out, Kaylee, are guys that are positioned to have a really strong Saturday. And if they do that, you wonder where things might be moving forward with them in terms of depth chart, in terms of playing time come the fall. Someone that we have not talked about enough on this show is Jake Pope, the transfer from Alabama. Here's what I find interesting about him. He was in the same recruiting class as Malachi Starks. He's also coming over with Travars Robinson, so he knows that system. And I do think that they probably compare what it was like to be in their positions mm -hmm. at opposite schools. And now Jake Pope coming over. This isn't somebody who just has no idea what they're doing. He understands the importance of playing for a dynasty, and he is experienced. Are we going to get the opportunity to be able to see him at G-Day? Well, I don't know if Jake Pope has experience playing in a dynasty. Alabama hasn't won a national championship since 2020. Okay, I will say – experienced coaching staff. I, I would that? say with, with Jake Pope in particular, I'm interested in seeing like sort of where he slots in. Is he on that first team defense? Is he worth the second string defense? How is he sort of battling there? Because he's a guy that, look, Tavares Robinson has a better scouting report on him than anyone in the country because he had a chance to see him at Alabama mm -hmm. for the past two seasons. And, and so with Pope coming in, they have obviously an opening at safety. And I know people might point to the fact, oh, he didn't play a whole lot at Alabama. Well, I think that's in part because Alabama had probably the second best safety in the country and Caleb Downs ahead of him. And so I think there's a trust there in what Jake Pope brings. He's obviously behind some of the veterans on this team. Ja'Cory Thomas is someone that has had a very strong spring. Georgia knows what it has in Dan Jackson. David Daniel is also a very well-known name at that safety position. But I think Jake Pope coming over from Buford, I know we're going to touch on K.J. Bolton here in a little bit, while they both are Buford teammates, I, I think Pope is maybe positioned better to make a quick impact at Georgia because, as you point out, Kaylee, he does have that SEC experience in his time in Alabama. Okay, so let me ask you this. You have the older guys coming back, guys like Dan Jackson, but then you have the younger guys coming in like Ellis Robinson. Who are you going to be keeping your eye on more, the younger guys or the vets? I mean, you have to pick the young guys here. It's our first chance to see a guy like an Ellis Robinson in that Georgia number 1 jersey. It's a chance for K.J. Bolden to go out there and make an impact. Uh, you know you know what you're getting with Dan Jackson. You know what he is. I think this is his fifth or sixth year in the program at this point in time. And, and so you know what you have there. You know, David Daniel is not going to surprise you this spring. You know, guys like Ja'Cory Thomas, who it's his third year in the program, Julio Humphrey there as well. They maybe still have some more room to grow. But you look at those young players, and I would include a guy like Daniel Harris, where this is his first spring game there. Chris Peel is another name worth mentioning in the secondary. I think it's those young guys, and I think that's a big reason why you get such an excitement because, look, Georgia opens the season against Clemson, and there's not, in my opinion right now, while Georgia is still a big favorite in that game, I don't think you can bank on getting those guys a lot of reps and sort of easing them into a game like that. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is a big chance to see what these guys do in a situation where there is at least some attention on it and, and seeing how they go out there and perform. So reflecting back on this conversation that we've just had, we just threw so many names out there, which goes to show that that room is so deep. There's a good chance that after G-Day is over, that room's going to be a little bit smaller. Do you have any predictions? I'm not going to name any names here because I think that's unfair to the players. And look, we've talked in the past. I mean, you even look at this defensive back room. Hula Humphrey and Daniel Harris announced their intentions to go into the portal, and yet they're still here, and one of those guys is going to end up starting for Georgia this fall. So in terms of naming names, I don't know if that's necessarily fair to anyone, but I think you look at positions where Georgia might have some portal losses because they do have to get down under the 85-man scholarship. I think defensive back with the number of guys that they've had 
I think that's a position where you might have a pretty good idea of who might be staying and who might be leaving, certainly just based on how much they actually get a chance to play on Saturday in G-Day, along with some of the buzz and chatter we have, or in some cases haven't heard about them at this point in their careers. So if you could only put put three DBs on your DBs to watch list, I know you don't want to name names, but you got to give me something here. Who are your three DBs to watch? I, I will take the easy layup here in K.J. Bolden. I, I think he's a fascinating guy. I was someone who was maybe a little bit more down on him coming in and making an immediate impact, but he certainly looked bigger than I thought he would this spring. And then obviously I think Alice Robinson has to take up the, the second spot mm-hmm. there. Number one cornerback in the country, Terrence Edwards, friend of the show, uh, showed the the leaping interception champ Bailey-esque that he made there. I think there are a lot of people interested in seeing can he possibly push for early playing time there. And then I'm going to say Ja'Cory Thomas, a name that we haven't heard much of, was not a megastar recruit coming out of the Orlando area there, but a guy that has gotten better every year. I think is a guy that Georgia feels really comfortable playing both that safety and that star position. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear a lot of positive things about Ja'Cory Ja'Cory Thomas coming out of G-Day in terms of what we see from him and really his first big-time opportunity with Javon Bullard and Tyke Smith both moving on. And speaking of positive things, Malachi Starks had a lot of positive things to say about K.J. Bolden and Jake Pope. Connor wrote about it on our DogNation.com site, so make sure to go check out that article if you want to know more about this DB room before we get to G-Day on Saturday. And now it's the names to know. Connor did submit these to me ahead of time. I didn't make him submit them to Cody. He actually trusted in me to give me these. So we're going to go ahead and get to the names you need to know because I know y'all have been waiting on us to talk about K.J. Bolden, and that is right why he's right there at the top of the list. The highest-rated signing in the 2024 class from the state of Georgia, a late flip. Some, I mean, I didn't believe that he was going to Georgia until I saw him put that hat on, but I just can't even imagine what his career is going to be like in Athens. Yeah, and you saw the impact that Malachi Starks came in and had as a freshman year one, and I think that's why of the guys on this list, K.J. is the only freshman that I picked. You could have obviously said Ellis Robinson here, but I think KJ, with the fact that you've seen Malachi do this, the fact that there's obviously openings at both the safety position but the star position as well, I think maybe there's a better chance to playing time there. And so this spring is going to be really interesting for him. I don't think he's going to be running with the first team, but when he steps out there in that number four jersey on Saturday, I think that's going to draw a lot of eyes and attention, and he knows that. He's played in a lot of big games for Buford High School, and I think people are going to be really interested in seeing how he goes out there and performs. And as we said earlier, veteran Malachi Starks had a lot of praise for K.J. Bolden. Here is Malachi on K.J. You know, he's very athletic, very smart. Uh, you know, just like all the young guys that came in with him, they all, they all have uh, – talents that they that they possess but uh you know he he's very uh he's like a sponge you know he just wants to soak up all the knowledge and all the information um you know you, you see him in media he's just writing stuff down uh you know and i think on the the thing that shocked me the most i think all the freshmen have that you know like i watch him in meetings that are all taking notes they're all writing stuff down so i think um i think that that class um is going to be very good is it, is it fair to say you reminded me of yourself a little bit? Um, a little bit. I'd say just a little bit. Yes, sir. I think he's downplaying it a little bit right there. There are so many similarities and comparisons between the two, not just because of their position, but they were both consensus five stars coming into the program, both names that people were consistently talking about and so i can't think of a better person that kj could learn from than malachi starks malachi starks is the best safety in america and i think kj bolden ultimately aspires to be that i think malachi is going to be a guy that leads this program leaves this program after this year walks into the nfl as a first round draft pick i think kj hopes to do that as well so the fact that kj is able to sit and learn from malachi for a year even if KJ doesn't see the field as much as some people anticipate, I think it'd be very beneficial for him over the course of his Georgia career. So the next name we have on our list is Jalen Walker, who played in all 14 games last year, led the team in sacks. And correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it was word for word that Connor said he was the president of the Jalen Walker fan club. I am. Jalen Car- Jalen Walker excuse me, is a top five player on this Georgia defense. And he's not number five. I think this is a guy who is as talented as anyone there is on this defense. And I think the reason I'm highlighting him here is, one, I just enjoy talking about him. But, two, (laughs) I think this spring is a chance for him to show what he can do with an inside linebacker position. That is where his long-term home is. That is where he sees himself playing in the NFL because at 6'2", 245 – 
While he's able to impact the passer in terms of coming off the edge on third down, he can't live there on first and second down and hold up against the run. So this spring, with Small Munden being out, has been a big chance for, for Jalen to play that inside linebacker position, just get reps there. That on a week-to-week -week basis last season, he wasn't really afforded because you have Jamon Dumas Johnson, you had Small Munden, and then you had C.J. Allen and, and Raylan Wilson in there as well. I think with Jalen, you're going to see him play a lot at that inside linebacker position. I'd be surprised at how much edge he plays in this game because Georgia has a lot of other guys they can use there. But how Jalen Walker plays at inside linebacker is just so fascinating to me because as touched on, as we saw in the Alabama game last year, he played 11 snaps in that game and he had two sacks on those 11 snaps. And so his ability to impact the game on an every down basis is so tied to his ability to play inside linebacker. And I think this spring game in particular is going to be a big chance for him to showcase that. Dog Nation, if there's anything that you should take away from what Connor just said, it's that you need to find someone that talks about you the way Connor Riley talks about Jalen Walker. I like my guys. I've been a big Jalen Walker fan, and I think he's going to have a really, really strong season. And I think if he can show that on Saturday, I think that's going to encourage a lot of people. All right, moving on to our player that you need to know, the transfer wide receiver Colby Young from Miami. So this is what he did at Miami. 47 receptions for 563 yards. Five touchdowns, considering that Miami was not an offensive powerhouse, barely scored any points. I feel like these are big numbers, and I think that he's just going to mesh so much better with the Georgia offense and having a guy like Carson Beck, and I think we're going to see that on Saturday. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to attend G-Day, and they're going to be doing some construction at Sanford Stadium, so it's obviously not going to be the full 92,000 capacity crowd there. You're going to see Colby Young, and as long as you're relatively close to the field, like that guy just stands out because of his size. He is mm -hmm. easily the biggest wide receiver on Georgia's team. And the fact that he's been able to come in, even while dealing with an ankle injury, really impress teammates and coaches with how he's played, I think is really encouraging. Clearly, Georgia saw that it needed to strengthen its wide receiver position and went out and added three wide receivers via the transfer portal. Young has had the best spring out of those guys, and while there are other wide receivers in my mind worth highlighting here in this space, Arian Smith has had a big game. Uh, Dominic Lovett could be someone I certainly take in their upcoming draft. I think with Colby Young, it's is how quickly does he connect with Carson Beck in this game because he's absolutely got the size to be a red zone weapon. And I think a big spring game from him only further validates what we've heard he do for Georgia this spring in the practice settings that they've had thus far. And moving on to our next name you need to know for G-Day, it's going to be Monroe Freeling, played in eight games last year, was a consensus five-star and he's had so much time to develop under what I believe is one of the best UJ offensive lines of all time. And I think that this year they're going to be even better. So I'm excited to see the development that he's made and the progress that he's made between last year and this season. Yeah, the reason I go Monroe here is I think a lot of people, you know, coming out of the end of last season, I think they just sort of expect Monroe to step in and be that next starting right tackle for mm -hmm. Georgia. That's not going to be the case. I, I do not expect him to be the starter on G-Day at that right tackle spot. I think that's going to be Xavier Trust with the first team offense. But like you've seen Georgia do in the past, whether it be Broderick Jones, whether it be Amarius Mims, they've shown that they're comfortable rotating in tackles uh, and to play various spots. And they're going to do that with Monroe Freeling. Monroe Freeling has as high a ceiling, in my opinion, as anyone on this offensive line. So I'm interested in seeing what that rotation looks like. How much does he play right tackle? How much does he play left tackle? And with that in mind, you know, again, Monroe, one of the bigger names. You mentioned five-star recruit, big recruiting win for Georgia and Stacey Searles in that 2023 recruiting cycle. How does he continue to develop there? Because I know at a lot of programs with a player like Freeling and his capabilities, you'd expect him to just go ahead and lock him in as a starter. He's going to have to wait to see the field. That was the case with Broderick Jones. That was the case with the Marius Mims. And while some have said that that might hurt their draft stock, those guys both ended up being first-round picks. I think Freeling has the potential to do the same. He's just going to be playing in a talented ensemble with guys like Ernest Green and Xavier Truss at the tackle position as well. And Mike Griffith's show on the beat, he actually said that he thought that not only was the offensive line UGA's strongest position group, but they had a chance to win the Joe Moore Award this year. And I don't think that happens without the rotation system that they get on and the development that they have to go through before they can claim that starting spot. Right, and you look at injuries have played a factor in this offensive line in recent years. Uh, you know, Jamari Sawyer briefly goes down during the 2021 season. Broderick Jones steps in and fills in well at that position, and then they ultimately make the big switch in the national championship game because they had already seen what Broderick was able to do. Last year, Amarius Mims, I believe, misses six games. Okay, they plug Dylan Fairchild in at left guard. They rotate Micah Morris in there as well, and they move Xavier Truss to that right tackle spot. Even in that game against Alabama, 
they had to make some changes there on the offensive line. So to have that level of depth, I think, is critical. And that development from Monroe is going to be so key for him. He's going to see the field this year. He's not going to play every snap like some people, I think, would hope or anticipate. But he's a guy that is going to have a very, very big say in whether or not Georgia ultimately does have the best offensive line in college football this year. And the last name on our list for names you need to know is going to be running back Roderick Robinson. I mean, we wanted to see him so bad on the field last year, has fought through so much injury. But I do think that him and Trevor Etienne combined can bring the standard of what the UGA running back room used to be, and I hope that's the case on GC. Yeah, I think it's easy to hear to have gone with Trevor Etienne, but I think we kind of know what Trevor it is. Mm-hmm. You've seen him play at Florida. You know he has that explosive ability. The reason I went with Roderick here is I'm interested in seeing how he develops in his second year with the program. He had some nice moments last year, but as you mentioned, missed a lot of games with an ankle injury. So how does he continue to show his development? Running backs, it's tough for them in these games because you know there's just not a lot of up the middle running and running doesn't play a big factor in this. So how is he involved as a pass catcher? Has he improved in that regard? How do they use him potentially in goal line or red zone situations? Because I think with his physicality, He's 240 pounds. He's going to play a very specific role for Georgia. And you can mention Andrew Paul here as well, Chauncey Bones. They're going to bring in some more running backs this offseason. But I think Roger Robinson, by all accounts, has had a strong spring thus far. And I think if he's able to punctuate that with another good performance on Saturday, I think that gives you a very good feeling in terms of what you have from a depth standpoint, where you have Trevor Etienne, who can be your home run hitter. And then you have Roderick Robinson, who maybe in that sort of Elijah Holyfield role can earn some hard-earned yards for you. So I know we don't like to address things like this on the show, but I, I have to ask, is injury something to be concerned about with him going forward? No, it was an ankle injury that I think just sort of lingered longer. And then you add in that you have Kendall Milton, you have Dejan Edwards. I think they were choosing to be more cautious with that because when that injury had sort of happened, Kendall and Dejan had been able to come back and be healthy at that point. You also have Dylan Bell, who was able to play some wide receiver there. I don't think it's a situation like, unfortunately, it became with Kendall Milton where you're monitoring injuries every year. And so I think it was just a one-time thing that maybe the ankle injury lingered a little bit longer. And the fact that he was a freshman was the reason that he didn't see the field rather than it is something that you have to constantly be worried about. So to wrap up, looking at this list, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have an honorable mention. Is there anybody that you missed? Uh, I'd love to shout out a defensive lineman here. And again, I don't know what exactly we're going to see from this group on Saturday because, again, you can't hit the quarterbacks there and they're not going to run the ball a ton. I don't know how much Kristen Miller is going to play because he has been dealing with a meniscus injury that kept him out of the Florida State Bowl win. But this is a guy that I think Georgia needs to absolutely be a star for this season. You saw him make some big plays at the end of the year, make some impressive steps in that game against Alabama. I think Jordan Hall is maybe a five-star guy that a lot of people are expecting to blow up. Mm -hmm. But I think Christian Miller is a guy who it's his third year in the program. He's got the size, speed, weight that you look for in impact defensive lineman. Well, he wasn't a five-star. He was still a top 100 overall recruit. And so I think this is a big spring and offseason for Christian as he goes in and tries to establish himself as potentially that defensive lineman that fills that sort of Devontae Wyatt type role that Wyatt developed into becoming a first-round pick. So Connor provided his name to know, but we're going to have everybody on the Dog Nation staff submit their names to know, and that's going to take place at our Dog Nation game day show, which is going to be at the UGA bookstore. And then, of course, Brandon Adams is going to have his infamous post-game show at the bookstore immediately following G-Day. Come join us. Come hang out with us. And we want to know who your names to know are. And now it is time for what Connor and I have been waiting for. It is our G-Day skill draft. All right, so we're going to have... Cody, come in. He's going to flip the coin, but here's the rules. We each get five players. We get to take a quarterback, three skill players, one defensive player. We're going to flip to see who goes first, then it's going to go in snake order. Is that? Snake is that, order. Okay, yes. yeah, thanks. I thought that was right. Uh, so it's all about strategy here. It's not necessarily a Connor Kaylee showdown, but I guarantee you it's going to bring the same energy. So, Cody, come on in. That's my first time on Dog Nation <laughs> at large. So I figured I needed to look the part, having to – I can't physically stay between you two, but let's keep it clean out there, as we always do. And we've got the coin. We're going to do the coin toss. If we get heads, Kaylee will go first in our skill position draft. If we get tails, Connor will go first. The flip, it is heads. So, Kaylee Mansell, you will get the first pick. Again, five rounds, one quarterback, three skill players, and one defender. And this is not who we think the best players are. This is who we think are going to be the best on G-Day, who are going to put up the best stats. So, Maybe something to think about there. All right, Kaylee, we'll let you go first. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and take it and get it out of the way. Give me Carson Beck. 
I think that's the obvious first pick there. Uh, I think he's going to have a big game. Uh, I think this is a game that, as we mentioned before, tailored to his skill set. And so that was, if you had not taken him first, I would have sprinted to the podium to take first. <laughs> yeah, we need like a buzzer. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. Um, so I have the next two picks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am going to go, I'm going to go Dominic Lovett uh, mm-hmm. with my first skill player pick. I know we touched on Colby Young there. I think that Dominic is poised to have a really big game. He has had a strong connection with Carson. I think he's been able to fill a variety of different roles for Georgia. And I think he's someone that can have a really big spring game and, you know, had a good first season at Georgia. But I think going into his second season, you hear us talk so much about quarterbacks and their second year as a starter and the impact that they can make there. I think Dominic Lovett can do something similar. And then I'm worried that you would take him and thus I can't get him back. So give me Jalen Walker. I know this might be a little early for a defensive player, but... I have to have this guy on my team. I think he's going to rack up tackles. He could come down with an interception. He's going to make plays for Georgia at that inside linebacker position, and he's going to really stuff the stat sheet there. So I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to get him. I'm going to take Jalen Walker with my second pick. So I go Dominic Love at one with my, one of my three skill player spots, and then Jalen Walker is my defensive player. <laughs> that could not have worked out any better for me. I wasn't going to take either. I wasn't going to take either of them, so um, thank you for clearing that. And now I don't have to use my defensive player because you went ahead and did that. All right, for my first skill player, I'm going to take Arian Smith. This is a guy who I I feel like is going to get a lot of reps, a lot of touches. He's a speedster. I think that he's going to rack up some yards, and he's a guy that he knows this offense, and I just have a lot of confidence in him that he's going to get it done on Saturday. I was actually worried that that's who you were going to take first was Arian because we had talked about him on Dog Nation Daily's Tuesday episode. So I think with Arian, the reason I didn't pick him is he could be boomer bust. He could have like three catches for 80 yards and two touchdowns, or he could have no catches at all. And that's no no fault of his own. Arian, Mm -hmm. by all accounts, has had a fantastic spring. But I want someone who I know is going to catch the ball. You know, Dominic Lover could finish something with like four catches for 46 yards and really impress in that regard. So I'm taking a value play here rather than a home run hitter in Arian Smith. This may be my pick that I end up regretting, but I'm just going to go with my gut here. I'm going to take Oscar Delp. Okay. Um, Brock Bowers is not here this year. I, I, I debated between him or Lawson Lucky because, as you know, G-Day is weird. Like, it's, it's the guys that you never expect that end up getting the most touches and, and make the biggest plays. But I'm confident in my guy, Oscar Delp, here. I do think that he's going to get a lot of reps. So, for my skill players, give me Carson, Arian, and Oscar. All right, so I've got the next two picks. These are my last two picks as we mm-hmm. knock out this draft here. Uh, I'm going to go with Roderick Robinson here. I'm going yeah. to take a running back. Uh, I don't know about uh, Trevor Etienne's availability for this game. We did not see Rob Roth Thomas mm-hmm. play in this game last year after he had been arrested right. in the offseason. And so I, I, given the uncertainty there, I'm going to take Roderick here. I think he's going to get some goal line carries. I think he's going to work with the second team. I think he could rack up some yardage there in that regard, sort of filling things out there. With my other skill player... I'm going to go really off the board here. I want to go Dylan Bell because I know he's going to be able to do a lot of different things, but I think you have to keep in mind, as you touched on there with Oscar Dell, these G-Day games are weird, and guys end up putting forth bigger bigger days that maybe are farther down the line. You have your G-Day legends, all-stars, Jonathan Rumpf. I'll throw a name out there. Those that know, know. Give me Anthony Evans here. I wanted to go Sokovi White, but I think Anthony Evans is a guy that is going to be able to make some big plays, use his speed, used in a variety of different ways here. I think Anthony Evans is maybe an off-the-board sleeper, someone that is going to be able to do a lot of different things for this Georgia offense. And while it is certainly not going to help people in the eyes of the public opinion, I'm trying to win the long game here. So give me Anthony Evans as a guy who's going to work with that second team, and I think he's going to be a guy that Gunnar Stockton, maybe a Ryan Puglisi target a good bit, and go about and improve their offense that way. Hold on. Let me recap this because I don't – hold on. Your three skill players, you took Dom Lovett, Roderick Robinson – And who was your last one? And my last one was Anthony Evans. Okay, for a second, I thought you had miscounted. I did not thought, think that you took a quarterback. I was sitting here I've thinking, got one pick left. I got this in the bag. I've got one pick left. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, all right. So I have – oh, I have my defensive player left, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, give me Michael Williams for my defensive player. So I have Carson – Arian, Oscar Dell, Michael Williams, and then ooh, need one more skill. Player. I know I need one more skill player, Connor. I'm I'm looking through my. I'm, now that I know what you have to say, I have to look through my little uh, list. Oh, give me Colby Young. Okay. Give me Colby Young. Talk about it. Okay. Well, I first off, I had him on the very bottom of my list because I thought that he might be one of the first ones that you took. But with as much 
um, praise that he's gotten this season, there's just no way that he's not going to get the ball a lot of times because I think they're going to need to be able to see what he's capable of in like a real like game setting and not just scrimmage like amongst the crowd. So I think that he's someone that's going to get a lot of touches, and I, I'm excited to see what he can do. And I'm also really confident in him being able to make those big plays and step up to the plate. You're not worried about Kirby Smart maybe trying to slow down the hype train at all? Mm-mm. Okay, fair enough. And with my last pick, i got to take a quarterback here. I'm taking Gunnar Stockton. I think we don't know how often uh, Ryan Puglisi is going to be able to play because of the knee injury he's been dealing with. Gunnar's going to get to throw the ball a whole lot. He's going to throw the ball around the yard. He's going to target guys like Anthony Evans and Roderick Robinson. And I think that's how I end up winning this. Not, you know, with style and flair, but just raw statistical output. The numbers are what the numbers are. My guys, they get on base. And so with that in mind, you know, again, we're not Carlos Peña out here. We're, Scott, we're a bunch of Scott Hatterbergs. And so I like my team with Gunnar Stockton at quarterback, Roderick Robinson, Dominic Lovett, and Anthony Evans is my skill players, and then defensively, I got Jalen Walker. I couldn't be happier with my draft. Honestly, I couldn't either. This is not exactly the way I had imagined our draft to go. I thought that we would have similar minds. I do like your pick in Anthony Evans here, but honestly, the guy on this list that I'm most excited about is Arian Smith because in the past, I just, especially this last year, you I want just, to believe. I, I you want, want to uh, yeah, maybe that's what it is. I just want to like manifest it and put it in the air that this is the season that we're really going to see him stand out and do what we know he's capable of and really use his speed to that full extent. And I think it starts on Saturday with G Day. Yeah, I think he's a guy, and look, he knows this as well as anyone. He's talked about it. Like his, so much of his journey has been, yeah, a great start. He's got incredible speed, mm-hmm. and then whether it be injuries or last season with drops and lack of consistency, I I think he knows what the narrative is on him. And the fact that he's gone out and had as strong a spring as he's had, he's undoubtedly already one of the winners of spring practice. He's able to punctuate that with G-Day. It's just stacking another good day. And I think he's someone who for so long hasn't been able to do that for a variety of reasons. And if he's doing that in this spring, I think that gives him more confidence come this fall. So I'm not sure if it's because Cody had that referee uniform on and we understand the seriousness, but I feel like this is the most civil discussion that we've had now and uplifted each other's answers. So clearly we're making progress, but what it all comes down to is our referee, Cody Chaffins. Cody. Yeah, let's take one more look at the rosters you guys have put together. First off, Kaylee, it's Carson Beck, Arian Smith, Oscar Delp, Michael Williams, and Colby Young. And for Connor, it's Dom Lovett, Jalen Walker, Roderick Robinson, Anthony Evans, and Gunnar Stockton. Those are your official. If I could put my Mel Kuyper hair on just for one minute and maybe analyze some of the draft, I think there's a miss. And kind of like you guys were talking about, that second half of G-Day, I think things are going to slow down a little bit. We're going to see a player like Cash Jones come in and rack up some yards because he's a player we know Kirby Smart likes. He's talked about him unprompted multiple times in press conferences. He's a guy that's going to see the field because coach wants to get him in there and play a little bit. So I think Cash Jones, maybe I'm one that you missed. Maybe I'll regret this when we look back on it next week. I mean, you can't argue with the official. That you yeah, I mean, what with. are we supposed to do at this point? Because no. if either of us try to argue with Cody, then we know we're already down bad going into the next week. So maybe Connor and I team up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Yeah, Cody, I mean, the the referee uniform just goes ahead and takes it to the next level. I mean, that's what Dog Nation at large is all about, is never knowing what's going to happen, and I think Cody just captured the essence of that. Hey, Cody gets the show. Welcome in, everyone. I hope you understand it as well moving forward. So I do want to mention that we are filming this on Wednesday. We typically film on Thursday, and that's because our good friend Connor Riley is going to the Masters tomorrow, his very first one ever. Who's your pick for the Masters? Uh, as as told on Dog Nation Daily this week, uh, Wyndham Clark is going to be setting up the champions dinner for the 2025 Masters. I like him a lot. Won, obviously, the U.S. Open last year. Nearly beat Scotty, Schle- Scott, Scotty Scheffler. Oh, boy, I'm getting, I'm getting loose here. Uh, <laughs> at the Players' Championship down there in, in Jacksonville. I, I think Wyndham Clark is poised to have a really big year. It is his first year, and, and so there is some concern there. If I had to give a, a maybe second-tier pick, Give me a guy that's won before, Hideki Matsuyama. Mm. One, obviously, I believe in 2021, or maybe it was 2022. The years all get crossed up now. But I think he's a guy that has played well this spring. I think he can come out. He knows and understands that course, obviously. 
and I like him a lot maybe as a second tier pick. I love the Masters. I come from a half side of the family that's like all golf family, but I have never been more excited for the Masters than I have been this year, and I think it's because I watched Brett Thorson do the Masters narration of Georgia football, and that got me in the spirit more than ever. So not only am I excited for you to go and hear about not just your concession experiences, but your Augusta National experience as a whole, but man, that Brett Thorson video got me like ready. Do you have an Australian accent? No, I don't have any accent other than the one that I speak in every single day don't even ask oh no <laughs> no you're not getting that from me all right guys this has been the first episode of dog nation at large we've had this in the works for a while so it's so exciting to finally be able to bring this to you guys and let you see that we've been working on for really what is the last couple months and you finally have a consistent name this will stick with dog nation at large we're not going to switch it up on you guys after this so in case you have been with us all along or you're brand new to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll have tons of articles coming out for G-Day this week. I will be on the Dog Nation game day show and Brandon Adams will be on the Dog Nation post game show right after the game. Come check us out at the bookstore. Dog Nation, thank you for joining us for the very first episode of Dog Nation at Large. We'll see you right back here next Thursday.